My name is Greg Gells. I'm CEO of CloudBite, and we're excited to be here today to talk about what CloudBite's doing and also our view on the future of storage. Many of you we've met, some we haven't. Hopefully today we're going to make this a very interesting session. Our goal here today is to give you some insights into what CloudBite's doing it, how we're doing it, why we're doing it, and then also what does that mean then for the audience that's, that's interested in actually evolving storage to this next sort of generational capabilities. So let me start out with a little bit about just the agenda. Which is we'll talk a little bit about the future stories to really put a context of why is CloudBite doing what we're doing? Because there's lots of storage innovation going on today and to really understand what problem are we looking at, how do we solve it, how is it unique, and how is it also a compelling problem in the market today. Then we'll do a little bit of a technology overview and Michael Williams will do that. Michael is Senior Director of Marketing for us and he's going to try and cover on behalf of one of the key co-founders, Felix Xavier, who has out with a, sort of a flu type of disease and stuff. So he wanted to be here. He was very much looking forward to it, but I think we're going to be able to sort of help and cover it. We also, on by Skype, we've got Umar Mukara, who is one of also the co-founders of VP of Engineering and he's joining us from India as well. So it's late in his evening, and we'll work through the challenges. But the goal today is to make sure we answer all your questions to the best capabilities that we can so you feel comfortable about what we're doing and why we're doing it from a standpoint. And then we'll do a demonstration. That'll be led by Satish Bhakta, who's a senior technical account manager, to be able to really give you some insights into how the CloudBite solution works, both Elastistore, is a core module as well as the Elasta Center from an <coughs> overall standpoint. With that, I think some of you have seen it. There's a free download that's available on our site from a capability standpoint to be able to test it, play it. It's a perpetual four terabyte license, so it really gives you a chance to look at behind the scenes the features, the management reporting, the utilities, all types of things within it, and find out that it really is something very easy to use from an overall uh, storage management standpoint. And then on Chalk Talk, we're going to come in and Umar is going to feature speaker to talk about some areas deeper into it from a performance standpoint and make sure you guys feel that behind the scenes there's an awful lot going on. It's a difficult problem we're attacking. We think we've solved it in a very elegant way. And then I think you guys will be able to, to feel comfortable that that's at that stage. A little bit about CloudBite, I'm not trying to be real commercial or whatever, but everybody wants to know who we are and what. We've just celebrated our three year anniversary. Um, so we're, as I say, old enough to have things that are mature, but new enough to be quite innovative. Because if you're too old, it's hard to be looking and solving new, the new problems of today from that standpoint. We service two primary markets, cloud service providers, and then the enterprise uh, marketplace as well. And in enterprise, we've seen a lot of traction and interest in the test and development environment. And that's because of the way they have to manage those internal resources um, in these tight budget capabilities. We've got software storage products, which is really what we're developing and delivering. Not hardware, but software storage products that combined with commodity hardware allows you to build scalable, reliable, enterprise-grade storage solutions out of industry standard components. And as I said, we've we got a, a key development team that's based out of, of Bangalore, India, as well as headquartered here in Cupertino, so right up the street. Stop by and visit us in either place if you're there, just to get a better insight into what's going on. And then, like many of the new startups today, we're a combination of different storage executives from a variety of landscapes, NetApp, EMC, IBM, HP, and most recently I was at SanDisk uh, as part of later in my career. And then venture-backed, nice partners in Fidelity and uh, Nexus Ventures. So here's where I get a little chance to sort of reflect and say, you know, why CloudBite? And I'm very excited to be part of the CloudBite team, and I've been here just about five months. And what I'm excited about was a lot of things that I've seen over the storage career. I've been doing this back since, believe it or not, when RAID, we had to spell it in those days, right? Fault tolerant storage was in its early stages. What was interesting is I was part of one of the first software-based RAID solutions that was developed in the market, but that was way back in the late 1980s. So one of the things that I haven't seen is a tremendous amount of real innovation in the broader storage market really in, in many years after that. 
I think it was about 2006 and seven where we started to see that sort of next stage of innovation that was really, I think, gonna make some transformations. And that was flash, right? We'd spun up disk drives about as fast as we could. We made them smaller. We did all kinds of things, but we never really addressed the performance requirements in a way that storage was required and capabilities to make it work. So I think those years, or I call it decades, were really about evolution and nothing really was, was revolutioning happening in the capabilities. So what I liked about Peter's quote here was, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. And the whole point is, is that these transformations, while are, are, are important and required, they're not about what you're using today, but what you have to be using tomorrow as the tool sets to really be able to move it forward from a standpoint. So I was fortunate in my last role to be on the early stages of enterprise class SSDs and to watch what was happening in the marketplace to see how we could create complementary capabilities to a cheap spinning disk with flash technology and be able to deploy it. We watched lots of innovations happen in that stage as flash became a, more of an adoption and we still have a long way for it to go today. We also saw innovation from companies like Fusion IO. Right? Who would have thought of putting flash inside a server that blurred the boundary between memory and storage? These kinds of innovations are still relatively in their early stages we move forward, but this is what we're talking about. How do we manage and harness these things as we go forward? So my fortunate element to, to, to be part of that early stage also left me with one thing that became very clear. CIOs I met with, storage admins. Everybody I talked to, I asked them about what kind of storage performance did they need? You know what they said? I don't know. The tool sets, the visibility, they didn't really understand. Most storage admins knew when they didn't have enough performance because it was a latency impact, but they didn't really understand how to sort of manage it in the capabilities. So in a lot of ways, we were solving those areas by being over-provisioned. Over-provisioned means waste. In tighter economic times, we've seen the budget squeezed. How do we focus on really providing not just cool solutions, but cool management tools that allows them to understand what they have and what they need to have as they move forward. Because the world has changed in many, many ways, especially as we've seen virtualization come in through the server landscape and really change the requirements for storage to be able to develop it. So let me kind of move forward and keep talking about why we were here. So we said first the server, now we see you know, uh, software really impacting what can happen in network and network capabilities and protocols. And it's finally making its way down into the storage world. What's interesting, though, is back in 1988, cloud didn't really exist, right? So, you know, we've got lots of transformations, not just in the storage market, but in the customers and the ecosystems and capability. We didn't have Google, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have a lot of things that are also transforming the IT industry that, are, that are, we have to be paying attention to. But cloud is clearly setting the bar, setting the bar for scale, setting the bar for simplicity, setting the bar for elasticity that's required within the business model and setting the speed, right? Everybody knows what used to be in IT, used to beg for resources and they might come around in some period of time. But in cloud, it's gotta be quick, it's gotta be spun up, it's gotta be self-service. It's a very different paradigm and that's challenging how things get done. The open approach. It's required. It used to be all proprietary silos, and you had your favorite one or your non-favorite one, depending on whether your vendor was in favor or not. But open is where the standards are all today. Everybody on everything that they're building has to have an open component so that they've got a way to be able to take and control the destiny of their requirements within those capabilities. And that is becoming true as we see the power of OpenStack, we see CloudStack, we see all kinds of open capabilities in other markets open compute as well as you see customers really saying, I gotta have capabilities to be able to manage my destiny. And I'll call it managing the benefits of Flash. I'm a big Flash advocate, I think it's great, it's a great tool, it's a great capability, but it's a turbo boost in a lot of ways that we've gotta be able to, how do we manage it? If we over provision Flash like we did for capacity to sort of deal with it, all we're gonna do is consume resources and use money in a way that we wanna do differently. So the tr real trick is how do you manage flash and all the benefits it does in a very cost effective but economical means. 
as I said again, all of the storage admins and CIOs I met who didn't know what kind of performance they need knew if they went to an all flash array or added flash, they didn't know how much they would need to add to really meet their business needs. And the real economics is add just what you need and scale the capabilities later. And then cloud storage, it's, it's already arrived. There are a lot of market studies that you'll see that talk about who's in share and what's in share, but there's a whole underground capability that's already gone on. There's a report from Credit Suisse that talks about how they call it do-it-yourself network, as he calls it, but modular storage has really taken over to be a predominant force that's going on in the market today. So it's here. It's going to be a, continue to be a force and a trend. As I talked about cloud, I think the two things that cloud, obviously, beyond economics, because everybody's got economics, but what it's really bought has been on the business agility elements to be able to do. We never had self-serve IT before. We had, you know, put in a ticket, see if you can get it back, see what the time frame is. But the, the speed with which businesses have to respond and react today is much different than it was before, especially in the IT infrastructures and capabilities. So business agility is still one of the things they're driving to the cloud. And in some ways, they look at it to make sure that service providers can be agile where the enterprise has to figure out how the agility comes into it as well. So, that's a key trend, and that means that you've got to have ways to not physically reconfigure, not be able to go out and acquire new equipment, but be able to provision or put forth existing equipment in a very quick and dynamic way. And that means scale up, but it also means scale down. We've also come accustomed to a paper performance sort of model and stuff. In some ways, I call it analogous to the mobile phone elements. If you use more minutes, you understand there's a, an economics benefits that, that pays in those capabilities where before computing was thought as an infrastructure piece and a cost, looking at how do you actually monetize it and figure out how it works. And then a transformation from the user. It's not about just a GUI, it's about user interaction. How do you provide intelligence so that you can make business decisions based upon what you're getting the feedback from your, from your infrastructure capability? As we know the difference, especially in the cloud between how much cost you put in infrastructure and how much revenue you get back means the difference of whether you survive or don't survive as we go forward. Again, commodity hardware, OpenStack, CloudStack, and even Apache as it's been seen is one of the only real big successes on a broad capability. But it's happening because commodity hardware is becoming more ubiquitous, it's more stable, it's more capable. People didn't think before Google really said, look, we're going to use commodity components that it was possible to build a scalable infrastructure and capabilities. But it's a very different approach. The old enterprise approach was make the hardware reliable and life is good. In the real web scale world, they said, look, the hardware is not going to be reliable. Let's use software techniques to be able to make it work. And that's shifting the paradigm of how things can be done. Breaking out from legacy lock-ins, this isn't just about NetApp or EMC or other guys. It's, you know, even now as we see, geez, do I want to get locked into an AWS? What's the ability for me to migrate and transfer the data? So being able to give fluidity for customers and choices is an important aspect of what they want to do. So they want to know they can take control as they have to in the capability. And then I'll say with a lack of standards, it's amazing is the REST APIs have filled a tremendous gap for making the interconnects between the systems and capabilities that are required for, the, for all of the market to really be able to have not just the manageability, but the connectivity and the, and the services capabilities within it. And it's not just going up and down the stack, but it's going across as the capabilities work. This is one of the things from a Credit Suisse report that you know, I thought was kind of shocking, which is you, when you see from the standard IDC Gartners and a lot of the industry reports, you see EMC share versus NetApp share versus IBM share versus HP versus all the sort of ones. It's real talking about just the external storage systems that are provided. And if you read those reports, you would think that's all the market. What this is really saying is that nearly half of the market is already built from modular components based upon these commodity components, based upon using open systems and tool sets and capabilities. That's essentially the non-storage market that's controlled by the legacy uh, vendors and capabilities. And that's pretty big and shocking, which says that there's already a movement that's gone on to embracing commodity components, modular hardware designs, and yet making scalable, reliable storage systems out of it. Excuse me, Greg. Sure. I mean, so the do-it-yourself storage component there is considered cloud? Is that, or is it, it's not JBI, because JBI was a different uh, element there. It's all actually. 
It's all actually, it's Google, it's Twitter, it's everybody who hasn't necessarily bought an external controller-based box from any of the big branded or smaller branded box controllers. So it's people taking and saying, look, I can get that JBOD, I can get those disk drives from Seagate, I can get those SSDs from Intel, my favorite supplier, whoever, and I'm building my own storage infrastructure together to be able to make that work. So as I say, if you read the normal reports, you would never think that the size of the market that is sort of flowing around the traditional enterprise storage suppliers would be that large. All right, let's move on to the next one then. Now that we see that actually there is a tremendous amount of storage capacity that's being served by that, that indirect of the modular build-it-yourself product. So one of the things I wanted to sort of say, you know, why CloudBite, why now? Why does it make sense? And certainly, to my own, why am I so excited to be part of this team? It's really the forces that are driving it. We all hear about the economic pressures. There's no doubt about it. Every survey tells you that the budgets aren't going up, but yet the storage requirements are. So there's an inverse pressure that's got to happen, which means you've got to figure out how you can maximize what you did. We had techniques, especially in the software world, that helped us at some pain points in the, few, in the past. You guys all remember the implementation of thin provisioning, right? It's a nice software technique that layers in and allows you to get more users on a specific storage device than you were able to get before. So it gives a great element of economics. And again, most of the world, we keep looking for software to figure out how we're going to solve other pain points. Virtualization has been a blessing, but boy, has it made storage a challenge. If you always look at what VMware says, the number one challenge for VM density or VM utilization, a lot of it is about quality of storage that they get. You know, they use the term an I.O. blender, which means a virtual machine in a virtual environment gives you a very dynamic storage workload. That wasn't what we had before, before virtualization was as popular as today. So how do you deal with that I.O. blender that's created out of the virtualization approach? Cloud service providers. Brand new category, brand new customer base, and a big one that has different requirements because they run between the thin edge of how much does my infrastructure cost and how much revenue can I make on it. That's a very tight, tight game to be able to play. And if you don't have that balance correct, you're not playing the game anymore, as we've all seen. So that's a new element in there. Predictable performance is probably as old as it's been, but it's meaning even more now that we've got those other factors in there. We've got virtualization that's given you these dynamic workloads. You've got cloud service providers that don't know what their customer profile is going to look like when they join. So how do I give them predictable performance? It's also one of the big obstacles, if you think about it, on enterprises moving systems to the cloud. If you're on an enterprise and you're managing a system and you think you've got it stable, but you don't know what the performance profile is, how do you pick it up and move it to a cloud environment? Right? You've got to be able to understand what it is so that the business gets what it expects from those capabilities. So predictable performance in the enterprise has always been the elusive chase. How do I get it? How do I manage it? And the reality is most of the systems today are statically configured trying to handle a dynamic workload. Now, if you over-provision it enough, it'll probably fit inside the box. But if you need to be able to be economic, it's going to have times where it's bursty, it's elastic, it's going to change, it's going to, going to create problems. And that's what we see in the dedicated silos. And then clearly software defined. Software gives you agility, the ability to move controls without being in the physically same place. Being able to manage a data center that's not underneath me from a, from a building standpoint, but down the street, across the country, around the globe, how do I be able to do these things? And the software capabilities have really what's been able to make that work. So all these things are driving this change that has to happen in the basis of storage capabilities. And as you learn more about what CloudBytes enabled in the software solutions it's providing, it, you can see how the storage landscape can be managed in a unique way for the elasticity that's expected, for the unique features that cloud service providers are doing. And clearly one of the elements I'll call it is predictable <laughs> performance. And whether predictable performance is I call it 212 IOs or thousands of IOs, depending on who you are and what you are, you just want what you need to be able to deliver that from a capability standpoint. And then also to be able to make sure it's software defined, and I mean that to elastically address those changing requirements. Because as soon as you think you've got it fixed, 
how do I adjust based upon the changes that are happening at the virtualization layer or my storage requirements? Or in the case of a service provider, I've acquired new customers. And that's going to all make change. And so how do you make it work from that standpoint? All right? Any questions? I know you guys are deep in this, so I know that a lot of this resonates from a standpoint of, but I wanted to sort of make sure you bring up the highlight points. So as you look through, as Michael and the rest of the team goes through both the architecture and the demonstration, you see how we are making our adjustments for this critical market and how you see storage is making a transformation in its own sort of unique way.